I'm a therapist. We have mentioned several times and we'll be mentioning over and over again those four words. What upholds your existence? As happy as me, you never see. Some people might stop and say, why did we end the series with that of all topics? Um, we might have ended the series on a higher note, a more positive note, um, say with uh, make every day a work of art. Um, but I chose We Are Our Own Worst Enemies because it's kind of like a final way of confronting ourselves, of seeing the truth about life and why we are the way we are and what we can do to change it. Um, some of you have probably heard this story from me before, but I'd like to begin by going over it again. I became involved in changing my life about 49 years ago. At that time, I was on as much a decline as any human being could be. In fact, uh, I had lost my career, my marriage had broken up, and uh, overall, on an emotional level, I felt like putting my head in an oven. And the only thing that really saved me at that point was I started doing research on a movie dealing with drug use and addictions and criminality. And my research took me to a place called Daytop Village, a facility in Staten Island, New York, for 105 hardcore narcotics addicts. And I went there ostensibly to <clears throat> research, do research for my movie. And as soon as I got there, I became involved in my own life. And that was the beginning of the change for me. And over the months at Daytop going to therapy groups, I didn't advance very much because I didn't really fully understand that I was indeed my own worst enemy. And my reaction to people's confrontations about my behavior and my particular addictions, although I didn't use drugs, <coughs> excuse me, I had a dozen other ways of shooting dope, um, including violence, risk taking, smoking, gambling, um, and a general attitude about life that was not very healthy. And I was extremely defensive at Daytop. Uh, whenever I was confronted, I would just push everyone back and defend and defend and defend. And I <clears throat> went through nine months that way, and then I went through a marathon session. A marathon group session is very unique in that after 15 to 20 hours of being awake and dealing with human problems, you become physically tired, exhausted, and your defenses drop you start opening up on an emotional level in a way that uh, is different than normal. And after about 48 hours of the marathon, I felt like I was bleeding from dozens of emotional wounds, and, and indeed I was. And I left the marathon, and I went into the living room and lit a cigarette, and someone who had been in the marathon with me, a young man named Jose Bly, sat down beside me and he just looked at me and uh, he said, uh, Nicholas, you don't understand, do you? And I said, uh, no, Jose, I really don't. And he paused and he took a cigarette from my pocket and lit it and I don't know how many minutes went by, but he just looked at me in the calmest, softest, most soothing way, and said, Nicholas, there's something wrong with you. And you know, when your knuckles snap, I felt a bone in my brain actually snap. And it was the first time in my life that I finally recognized not only what they were talking about, but what I'd never learned, 
that there was indeed something wrong with me. And a few moments later, I had a flash of many different things in my mind that I had always blamed for whatever was going on in my life that was wrong. Um, my family environment, dysfunctional for the most part. Um, an abusive brother. Um, growing up in uh, a neighborhood that was quite dangerous. Relatives who I did not like. In fact, I think I hated most of them. And uh, the church, the Greek Orthodox Church, which um, I wanted to blow up, actually, emotionally and physically. I thought that was why I was the way I was. And at that moment, I suddenly realized those things were real. They had happened to me. <clears throat> but here I was, a grown man, with all of these problems, and I'd never taken the responsibility for them. I'd never finally said to myself, I am my own worst enemy until that moment. And I think that most people, and over the 48 years since I've been working in the field of therapy, most people don't take responsibility for their own lives. They understand that they had uh, shortcomings growing up, that there were problems, but they never see how it evolved to the present. And here it is now, we are who we are. And uh, that was the beginning for me. How did we fall into this horrific trap? A seemingly unending pattern of blame and guilt established in early childhood. When we're children, we don't really understand blame and guilt. <coughs> and uh, it's not explained to us by and large. No one sits us down and says, um, look, um, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to do things that are wrong. Um, and it's okay, you have to learn from them. And uh, because we're telling you that um, you're doing something wrong and we want you to change it, doesn't mean you have to feel guilty about anything, as if you're bad. Well, no one said anything like that to me, and I rarely have ever heard from anyone when they discussed their childhood that someone actually was able to talk to them in that way. We internalize blame and guilt, and it's very insidious, and it never leaves us. That guilt remains there, and it affects us throughout our lifetime. Pointing the finger itself is reinforced by teachers in our early school years. We go into the schoolroom, and uh, it's another new world to us. And uh, by and large, it's not a very positive world, because we're thrust into a situation where we're competing with other people, and we're being tested as to what our skills are or are not. We get grades, um, and if we're among the elite, um, we get an A, and uh, instead of the finger being pointed at us as being ignorant, dumb, lazy, or whatever, we walk away somewhat unscathed. But even those people have had to compete and have had to feel the pressure and the stress and strain of getting those A's and working hard without really understanding what the whole purpose is. Entering adolescence and into adulthood, self-punishment becomes a habit. We don't even realize we're doing it, but we punish ourselves so often in so many different ways. We start taking on habits of other people we start behaving according to not a deep feeling of what we need to do, but according to what everyone else is doing, our friends, our peers, our family, and our society. All along, we experience on-the-job training and negativity from family and friends. I don't mean to project to anyone, but when I think about what I was learning, you know, how to gamble, how to smoke, how to drink, how to curse, how to do a lot of dumb, stupid, negative things that I thought were pretty normal. Doesn't everyone do that? I thought to myself. I didn't see any 
positive role models who were different, unconsciously we cry out for help but no one really hears us. They turn away. Not alone because they have no concern for us, but often because no one quite knows what to do, what to say. I remember when my father died, I was 14, and the next day I was walking down the street in my neighborhood where my friends always met, and a friend of mine, Eli, walked up to me and he said, hey, how are you? And I just looked at him and I said, um, my father died yesterday. And he looked stunned and just looked at me and, and he didn't know what to say. He didn't know the words, he didn't know how to express his feelings. He just looked at me and we both kind of drew a blank and we didn't understand. We go from the fire into the frying pan, we take on the trappings of classic negative conditions that assail humankind. We give in to jealousy, lust, and greed and become addicted to them. It's been said that the world suffers from these three classic problems, jealousy, lust, and greed, and uh, very few people escape this pattern. Defensiveness, denial, and ego guide our actions, thoughts, and destinies. That triangle of defensiveness, denial, and ego is perhaps the most obvious one that we can point the finger at and say there is where we all went. That's the habit we all developed, especially in our society. Defensiveness is automatic. If we're confronted about anything, and confrontation, by confrontation, I don't mean someone's going to punch you in the face. I'm just saying if someone just says something, um, our immediate reaction is no. <clears throat> and we turn it on the other person. We get defensive. And we use an array of different defenses. And it's the standard. Then we deny. We, we absolutely refuse to accept any responsibility. That's the model in our society. I've told the story many times about catch the guy with his hands right in your pocket trying to grab your wallet, and you call for the police, and he'll accuse you of defamation of character. He'll blame it on you. And that is the model in our society. Everyone, by and large, denies responsibility for everything. Our leaders, they never admit to any mistake. Church leaders do the same. Come on in, Barbara. There could be evidence of thousands and thousands of children being molested and raped by religious people, and no one will take the responsibility for it. Same is true with doctors, lawyers, politicians, statesmen, supposed statesmen, nobody is willing to say, I'm wrong, I made a mistake, I did something wrong. We are a society of angels by and large according to what actually goes on. And ego, easily the most destructive force in human nature. That which, when opposed, seeks to assert itself is ego. When the ego dissolves, then and there we're capable of all qualities. We partner with emotional overload, mental debris, and physical disability. This is another classic triangle that really represents the overall human condition. If we want to describe what depression is, there's depression, emotional overload, too many feelings that we cannot relate to, cannot process. They build and build and build until we just can't seem to handle it anymore. And it's kind of like a breaking point and then we run to the doctor for medication. 
and he diagnoses us as depressed instead of saying, you're not handling your emotions. Apropos of that, if we take a look at what happened last week in Connecticut with those 28 deaths, you see exactly how we handle that kind of responsibility in the most cockeyed way imaginable. Two factions, the polarization immediately, gun control on one end and mental health on the other. Neither of which is really responsible for the problem. Responsibility lies in the fact that we do not know how to handle feelings. We don't know what emotions are about. And everything that is basically an emotional problem or disorder is labeled as a mental problem. Mental health. You'll notice in all of the things going on about the shooting and the aftermath of that, what is being addressed is mental health as opposed to emotional reality. And the reason for that is quite simple. There's no money to be made with emotions. The only people who can really relate to emotions in a way that is professional and that earns them a living are artists, actors, singers, dancers, musicians, writers, and evangelists. There's no money for the doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists or the drug manufacturers to make from emotions. So they label everything as a mental problem. And then they're clever enough, and it is cleverness, not truth, to give us the idea to support that of we have these imbalances, neurotransmitter imbalances or other imbalances something up there that's causing the mental problem. And the public, once again its own worst enemy, buys into it, accept it immediately because it goes unchallenged. And these people should know. They're the professionals, they're the scientists, the doctors, the research people, the medical authorities, the psychiatrists who basically govern all of that and they don't know what they're talking about. They're not even using the right words, the right language. They're not addressing the underlying problem, which is emotional, not mental. As you've heard me say a number of times, in all the years I've been dealing with people with depression, I've never yet heard one person say, I think depressed. Everyone says, I feel, I feel depressed. It's emotional. But because we don't understand that, the emotional overload continues to build. And the pharmaceutical people are delighted with that. They can give us more and more medication to deal with what they call a mental problem, which in reality is purely emotional. The mental debris that follows as a result of the emotional overload, um, we dramatize. We take what are fundamentally problems, human problems, that we all experience. There's no way we can go through life not experiencing problems. And we take these problems and we build them into dramas, huge dramas. That's why we end up indulging in saying things like, oh my God as if we were dying as a result of ordinary problems. Physical disability comes in right behind that. Not only are we a nation that we can basically say is emotionally crippled, we are physically crippled as well. We have the worst health in the industrialized world by far. Nobody's even a close second to us. I'm not talking about third world countries. I'm talking about the industrialized world. England, Canada, Germany, France. 
we're not anywhere close to the people who are really healthy. I went to Cuba, as you've heard me say a number of times, about five years ago, and I walked through the streets of Old Havana, and uh, the walk, um, three and a half, four hours, and during that period of time I crossed paths with a quarter of a million people, including people in their 80s and 90s smoking long stogies, and they were all healthier than we are. Everyone looked like they were in condition to fight. People playing ball, dancing. All physically looking good. We can't say the same about our society at all. Just recently on the news there was an announcement that the countries that had the happiest people, they were all Latin America and South America. <laughs> Yeah, we're, not a, we're not a happy people. <clears throat> How could we be with so many people depressed, so many people medicated, and so many people suffering from poor health? Twice as much heart attack, twice as much cancer, twice as much stroke, three times as much high blood pressure, four times as much diabetes, six times as much obesity, <clears throat> and perhaps 8,000 times as much depression. So we're not a very happy society or a fit society or a healthy society. We become specialists, experts at our own weaknesses and melees. That word melees is something that I strongly relate to because I think that our society suffers from this malaise, this lack of energy, lack of strength, lack of something. When Jimmy Carter was president, he actually confronted the country at a press conference one day. <clears throat> he said it very clearly, and he caught hell for it. The cabinet people came down on him. His <clears throat> All his administrative people met with him and said, you can't say this to the public. This is uh, going to turn them against you. So he backed off. It was the biggest mistake of his presidency. And I think more than even the Iran kidnappings that followed, I think that was responsible for his not being elected for a second term. He recovered his naturalness in recent years by looking at the public and telling the truth and standing behind it, something he wasn't able to do while he was president. So I respect him for that, but our nation does suffer from this general malaise, this overall, overall debilitating sense of who we are. Rather than change, we take on more negative behavioral patterns such as clutter, procrastination, bad diet, lack of exercise, and an overall poor lifestyle that includes many different types of addictions, of course. We don't want to deal with most of these things, by the way. Um, look at the average shopping cart, and you're going to see all the junk food, you know, the terrible things that we eat, the processed foods, all the sugar, all the salt, all the garbage, and we wonder why we're so sick. We're told that um, if we eat red meat frequently, it's going to lead to high cholesterol levels, it's going to lead to heart problems, but we go right ahead and do it. We don't change. We refuse to exercise. 80% of the American public does not exercise. Above the age of 40, that percentage rises, and by 55 or 60, it's closer to 92 to 95 percent. And of the small percentage of people who do exercise, better than 95 percent of those people don't know what they're doing. They simply have not received any intelligent instruction in terms of what they need to do in order to exercise. And above the age of 50, 
exercise becomes the number one issue in life and in terms of health, it's going to be the breaking point. It always is. As we begin to age, the aging process can either be slowed down or accelerated. Simple as that. It's simple mathematics. You can slow it down with good diet and primarily with exercise, or you can just let it slide the way it's going, which will accelerate things. And with all of the additional problems such as poor diet, air pollution, and the rest, the acceleration increases and it affects the very nature of how we live, in other words, the quality of life. The drug manufacturers, with all of their drugs, with all of the trillions of dollars spent in developing this junk, which is what it really is, have managed to increase the average lifespan of the American by about nine months. Let's give them credit for even a year, a year and a half. But what takes place during that additional time? Quality life? No. More medications, medical procedures, more doctors, more expenses, more time in the hospital, more insurance problems, more worries, more stress. All because we refuse to deal with the main, main issues in life such as diet, exercise, and keeping away from medications. I can never say enough about that point to people. The street addict calls his dope junk because he knows it's junk. What we get from the prescription is equal junk. The only difference between the junk on the street for the dope addict and the junk that the doctor gives you is that one is legal and the other is illegal. So we talk ourselves into thinking, oh, it's okay because it's a prescription and it's given to me by a doctor, therefore it's okay. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's junk, it's poison, and it destroys not only your health, but your immune system, which in turn accelerates the aging process even more. In our ever-weakened state, we fail to see all the red flags warning us of danger. It's like we're deaf, dumb, and blind. We, we, we refuse to just see what's actually happening. And not only in ourselves, but in people that we know. Walk down the street and look at each person. Just look at the faces of people. Look at the way they're walking. Unhealthy, unhappy, unfit people. And we somehow think that we are going to escape this. We're unique. We're not like them. And we're dead wrong. We're dead wrong. Unless you can actually look at yourself and say, I am healthy, truly healthy, I am fit, truly fit. I'm happy, truly happy. And also say to yourself, I've got good relationships. I'm building more relationships. I'm open to relationships. I'm doing creative things in life. Unless you can say those things, then you've got a serious problem. And you are your own worst enemy because you refuse to actually see this and acknowledge it. Why do we remain our own worst enemies? Repeatedly drawing from destructive tendencies, we see ourselves in a negative light, consequently setting ourselves up for the same types of unhealthy experiences. <clears throat> what goes around comes around, and we cannot see any way out of the dilemma. Most people treat it as business as usual. What can I do about it? You know, any more than I can fight City Hall, I can't actually do anything about these things. Which is another example of being our own worst enemy. We can do an awful lot. By the time we turn the corner of midlife, we are faced with growing fears, 
and knowing that death lies ahead, further entrench ourselves in our unending drama. Lack of companionship, fear of not having enough money add to our drama. The money issue in our society is of paramount importance to everyone. Um, we are a consumer society. We buy things, we need things, we want things, we possess things, we collect things, more things than anyone else in the world. Um, and that costs money. So we're always frightened of money. And even those people who have plenty of money are still frightened. It's hard to understand that one. You, know, you, you look at it. Um, I had to administer my brother's estate after he died. And uh, so many strange things about it. He had plenty of money, but he wouldn't pay a $16 bill. He wouldn't, throughout his lifetime, wherever he was, he would get a library card, take out lots of library books, and never return them. He refused to return library books. would get into litigation with people over $10 and go on for months. Why? Is that un strange? No, it's, this is the way the society operates. We're so frightened that even if we have everything we need, we act as if we don't. The act as if is the most powerful learning tool there is, but it can be used for positive or for negative. And so many people act as if they have no money, that they're broke. And you look at them and you... I, I tell the story in Greece. I had um, a number of people who were involved with me and a venture of mine in the newspaper business. And people advertised in my newspapers and in the second year of publication, <clears throat> I went around to these people, uh, and I remember going into this huge, huge building. Uh, this guy is basically the camping king of that part of the world. Um, anything related to camping, from equipment to tents to camping trailers, you name it, this guy, that's his business. Huge, huge organization. And I walked into his office, which is as big as this, and as soon as he saw me, he assumed I was coming to ask him to advertise again. In actuality, I was coming to give him some free advertising. But he looked at me and he threw up his hands and says, I'm sorry, but I can't do anything this year. I'm in a desperate position. And he went on to list about 12 financial problems including the fact that he had a child recently and he and was worried about being able to put food on the table and keep the lights on. And he went through this litany of, you know, this drama about his terrible economic situation. And I looked at him and I said, uh, yeah, and he said, well, what are you going to do? And he looked at me and said, well, I have no choice. I have to call my lawyer and have him sell one of my houses in Athens. <laughs> Real estate in Athens is as high as you can imagine. Poor man, he's got to sell one of his pieces of real estate in Athens. Pity the poor! But so many of us act that way and walk around as if we're in poverty. And then you see in other places in the world, people who have just enough to get by and they act as if they're wealthy. Complete opposite of what we do. This personal dynamic fraught with failure and self-anger mirrors itself in the same self-destructive patterns that we see in our community and greater society. Is there no hope? We weren't born our own worst enemies. It's not in our genes or DNA. It's not. We, we were born with you know, a sense of... Uh, Fun and lightness, happiness. A child, you know, sees the world as a wonderful place, sees life as a wonderful thing. 
<coughs> wants to dance and sing and have fun and play. A child isn't born its own worst enemy. It doesn't want to live that way. It wasn't our intention to learn how to suppress what we feel and think. We were born free. We're meant to be free. But yet we're not. A lot of us relate to freedom um, in a very abstract way, as if um, we really were free. But we're not. Try to express what you feel. You're going to be stopped. Try to express what you think. You're going to find a lot of obstacles. Not that easy to really be free. And we're taught how not to be free. We're taught from the earliest age, shh, be quiet. Don't be frightened. Don't get angry. Don't cry. We're taught to suppress all the natural feelings. That young man in Connecticut who killed all those people is among those millions and millions of people who were taught how not to express feelings. And eventually, by not expressing feelings, the feelings come out some way. They fester inside of us. We feel the pain. We suffer the emotional overload. And then that comes out in very destructive ways. Vileness, threat, hostility, and violence. As I've said a number of times in the 16-week series, we suffer from the greatest amount of depression in the world and also the greatest amount of violence, such as this action last week in Connecticut. And the correlation between the two is, should be obvious. If it were not for the medical, pharmaceutical, psychiatric societies who tell us it's up here, we would have a basic understanding of what the problem is and perhaps be able to deal with it. Animals sense what's going on, and so can we, but we have to trust our instinct, which we don't do. We don't go by our instinct. We go by what we see other people doing, and misery loves company indeed. Everything's a habit from day one to our last breath, and it can all be changed. <clears throat> Everything, everything we do is not based on DNA, as a lot of people are led to believe. And these things are not in our genetic makeup. We learn these things. The way we walk, the way we stand, the way we talk, the way we eat, the way we dress, clothes we wear, music we like, jobs we take, everything is a matter of habit forming every single one of these details. And just as we learn all the bad things, we can change them, and we can learn good things. Just as we refuse to exercise, we can learn to exercise. Just as we refuse to eat properly, we can change that. Just as we suppress our feelings, we can change that. We can learn to express what we feel and what we think in a natural, normal way. We can change all of that. Life could be wonderful, a work of art, if we used our minds and our brains, if we were individuals, as opposed to simply following what everyone else is doing. I am here because there is no refuge finally from myself. These are the words that I first saw written when I went to Daytop that first day. I'd like everyone to think about those words for a minute. Finally, there is no refuge from ourselves. If we could only recognize that there is no refuge, no matter how defensive we are, no matter how many times we've repressed all of our feelings and thoughts, we'd realize that um, there is no refuge 
And what we really need to do is to step outside of the box that we've placed ourselves in and start living a life that uh, we're meant to live with the idea of living, loving, and creating. Doing our life's homework. Why are you your own worst enemy? Everyone should take out a pen and paper and put that down. Why are we our own worst enemy? What are we doing? If you're not satisfied with life, problem solve and do it without drama. <coughs> Again, if you're not happy, healthy, and fit, if you're not getting out of life what you want, then you should problem solve. And there's a basic formula for problem solving. Very simple formula. One, define the problem. What is it? I'm unhappy, I'm unhealthy, I'm unfit, I hate my job, I want to shoot dope. Whatever, just define it clearly, spell it out. Most of us have three or four primary problems and three or four secondary problems. Write it down. What prevents us from dealing with the problem? There are two things, the emotional and the practical, and we must deal with both the emotional and the practical. Sometimes it's almost all emotional fear. Fear prevents us from dealing with problems. Fear makes us sit on the fence, makes us wait, procrastinate. Fear of making a mistake, fear of looking bad, fear of losing. Fears. We have to learn to deal with the fear. The practical end, we've got to learn that part also, and we've got to deal with both. We have to get Feedback, this is something that's sorely missed in our society. I've said so many times what we really need. We need a day top in every community, somewhere where we can go and people identify with one another. One of the reasons things like Alcoholics Anonymous and um, Gambling Anonymous and programs like that benefit people a great deal is not so much because of therapeutic things, but primarily because people identify with one another. They suddenly are face to face with other people who have the same problem. They no longer feel alone, and I can't tell you how many times people say to me, I feel that nobody could understand me. You know, I feel so alone. And that's not true. People can understand. People can identify. And when you get that identification, it humanizes you. You suddenly feel I'm not alone. Other people do know what I'm going through. Other people go through the same things. For the most part, we all go through the same things. The only difference is our name, date, and place. But basically, we can identify with everything. Getting feedback. We don't get feedback. And when we do get it, most often it's negative. Friend who doesn't know anything about love relationships, who've had nothing but broken relationships, will tell you how to deal with your wife. Everyone is very free with their advice. <coughs> Guy who's gone bankrupt four times will tell you how to deal with your financial affairs, how to handle your business. Everybody's got advice to give. All experts. So many unhappy, unhealthy, unfit people giving advice, and we take it in, and we absorb a lot of that negative advice instead of recognizing that this person doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. <coughs> Take in feedback only from individuals who have successfully navigated the waters that you are in. Only. Don't take in feedback from people merely because they're your friends. Those friends are the ones who will say, go to the doctor and get, get, get yourself a pill. Everyone will be quick to give you advice. Take in feedback only from sources that are authentic, that you know will help you. Otherwise, don't go near it. Weigh everything. Once you have dealt with the emotional and the practical parts of things, once you've gotten the 
identification and the feedback, <clears throat> then put it on a scale and weigh it. What am I going to do? And unless there's some unknown factors, decide what to do. Don't wait. Don't procrastinate. What if you do make a mistake? You'll recognize it, you can change it. But don't wait. Once you've made a decision, commit yourself to the decision. <clears throat> Commitment is the key to everything. I tell the story about Daytop, that same Daytop I've talked about, that facility of 105 hardcore narcotics addicts. In the year that I was there, going to groups three, four times a week, marathon sessions and the rest, I think I heard about approximately 3,000 commitments made at Daytop. Wide range of things from uh, people going to finally start taking care of what they're supposed to take care of, everything from getting in touch with their kids and child support to quitting smoking to losing weight to, you know, really getting down to business, whatever. They, commitments, because that was forced on you. The whole process was one of deal with problems. 3,000 commitments over a period of about a year, and except Please, unless you've heard this before, just want only the people who haven't heard it to guess at this. How many of those commitments do you think were kept out of approximately 3,000 commitments? Anyone want to guess? Ten. Ten? Twenty percent. Twenty percent. One hundred percent. Not one commitment was broken. Not one. That seems extraordinary. 105 former addicts, felons, yet they all, <clears throat> every one of them kept every commitment they made. Reason is that um, <coughs> it was built into the whole structure of their existence from the time they were in prison. It's prison code, basically. In prison, if you say you're going to do something, you better do it, or else you are going to be hurting badly, whether it's your fellow inmates you've made that promise, commitment to, or the jailers, you learn to keep your commitments. So when these people went to Daytop, that was built into the program. We are here because finally there is no refuge from ourselves. We are our work own worst enemies, and when we make a decision and make a commitment, you're going to do it. And every commitment was kept. And not surprisingly, once you act as if you will keep your commitments, you do it. We started a program, first community-based drug prevention program in America in Greenwich Village shortly after that. I was its director. We had the same basic ideology, and consequently, nobody broke commitments there either. Everybody when they made a decision, was asked, is that a commitment? Yes, that's your honor contract with yourself. And everybody kept their commitments. It's not that hard to do. Once we make the decision, then we can do it. Um, how about that program that is right across the street over there? It used to be called S. But it's something else now. Landmark? Landmark, thank you. Are you familiar with Landmark? I know of it, but not familiar with it personally, okay. no. What is the connection with commitment? And well, just for, there's something that you <coughs> said a little bit ago. But I've never taken Landmark, but I know people who have, and I've said and that it is about confronting, um, you know, belief systems and way of life and stuff like that. And I think that there's probably a process of commitment. Did you take, did you do landmark? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that similar? Yeah, and landmark teaches you to recognize the patterns you have, and there's tools so you can use them to identify patterns, self-destructive negative patterns you have. Mm -hmm. But around commitment, um, 
there's a lot of guilt, you know, when, if you're not making them, and a lot of stuff around it. And they're really good about teaching you how to just, like, there's nothing wrong. You know, this is what you did. You know, if you either did it or you didn't. Mm -hmm. And then you look at it and own it without shame or guilt or any drama. And then you decide, and you either recommit or you say, no, this wasn't something I, I, I want to do. And then you, you recommit, you know, you, you say, I, I'm not going to go forward with this. But you, you know, you, you, you acknowledge that you've made the commitment, you acknowledge the impact. Like, you know, I, I made a commitment to my group that I would be here all the time and I've not been there and I apologize for the, for, you know, my not showing up. Am I not contributing to the group and the impact it's had on people, and and um, and then typically you recommit. You know that I'll be my word. I will be here on time. I'll be. Uh, but if there's something in the way that that's not working for you know you're not going to do it, then that, then you also can say I'm not going to be part of this group anymore. And then you might get called on. Why not? But <laughs> by the way, connecting to this. Most people don't know the history of all of this, but just to go over it briefly, it started in 1958 in Santa Monica, California, with a group called Synanon. A man named Chuck Dietrich started this program, and it was the first attempt to really cure drug addiction, and the first successful attempt to do it. Um, it was a tribal situation that created an atmosphere of family that was missing in most of these people's lives. And uh, it was solely focused on confrontation. And the key to it was that each person had to be responsive to the next person and couldn't lie. No violence, no drugs, no lying. Three laws. and. Uh, you couldn't really get away with anything there because uh, you'd have Gold Tooth Louis sitting in one corner confronting Jake the Fake over here. And Jake the Fake couldn't use his typical defensiveness because he knew that Gold Tooth Louis probably invented the defenses that he would try to run. So that kind of identification was very, very strong and they created what became known as confrontational therapy and reality therapy and encounter therapy. They're all one and the same. And then that program was adopted by a group on the East Coast called DATOP, the same DATOP that I've talked about so frequently, and that's how I became involved. <clears throat> and then hundreds if not thousands of other programs were spawned as a result of sitting on DATOP. All the people who created the programs, which are now called the landmarks and the rest, came out of that melting pot. And including, I mentioned Jose Bly, who sat down with me, that gentleman who said, Nicholas, there's something wrong with you. He ended up running four different programs on the West Coast. So all of those things developed as a result. I must say that a lot of the concepts have unfortunately been watered down, or not nearly as strong as they were back then. So um, it, it's a mixed bag, unfortunately. <coughs> I am quite familiar with the 12-step program. 12-step program, <coughs> yeah. Which was started in the 30s. Right. And uh, time and again, I hear the, the speak, and it's, it's the same speak as what was done in the 30s. In my opinion, something successful, somebody tried to capitalize on it and make a paying program out of it. And yet, I am in defense that it is available free. And uh, everything that I see written here on this paper has been brought up uh, at Melody Beatty, Codependent No More. And again, with Codependence Anonymous, the 12 step program, I've been exposed to everything here. Uh, is there no hope? Well, what are we supposed to do? Actually, the, the homework part. The fourth step of the 12 step program, we take our own inventory. The inventory I took start with resentment. Everything I resent, that so-and-so hadn't done such and such starting at earliest times. And then I moved to the fear list. Everything I've been afraid of starting at earliest times, fancied or real, the imagination. You've, you speak all the time of the imagination and the inability to separate reality and imagination. 
Then the third list that I took was uh, desire, basically, uh, sexual inventory, fancied or real, again, is imagination. And to actually look at this stuff myself, then I confront myself. Someone only walked me through the process. They were not my higher power. It is a beautiful change, but that was started in the 30s and mm -hmm. it was free. Right. It's an incredible thing. That, uh, I'm, I'm saying that what you're saying of it starts, uh, starting in the 50s. Therapy, the therapeutic part started in the 50s, group therapy as we know it now. The other programs, and there were things going back to tribal <clears throat> times in the 17th and 18th and 19th century for that matter, but they weren't really designed as therapies. They were not explored on that level. Synanon was the first actual therapeutic center of its kind. The 12-step program is not group therapy. No, no, not at all. Any more than AA is in those things. Right. Again, the strong part with all those programs was the identification and how people took it from there up depended on them. But in terms of what is needed, um, basically we need concentrated focus. What it takes us 30, 40, 50 years to develop to being our own worst enemies is not going to be solved by simply reading information or by identifying. It's going to require tools and concepts and those tools and concepts do exist, of course. They do. Um, what are the things you must change? List the habits, attitudes, and weaknesses. Are you ready to turn your decisions into commitments? Will you honor them? Love yourself. Go from being your own worst enemy to your own best friend. Reverse the Misery Loves Company program. Toot your positive horn and pull others along with you. Become a role model. Uphold your existence. The concept that I deeply believe in and I've shared with people time and again is four words. Question, what upholds your existence? Instead of what should I do? The reason this is so important is that it opens the mind. Our society is nailed shut with polarization. Everything is split between one faction and the other. In favor of gun control, against gun control. In favor of abortion rights, not. In favor of capital punishment, not. Medical use of marijuana, not. Everything is polarized. Every single issue in America is polarized. And none of them are resolved. You've heard me say at least eight times to suggest to people, Google 1968 presidential issues, and you'll come up with about 25 to 100 issues, topics <clears throat> that were you know, being discussed at that point. If you look at the list of things, you will discover one, not one of those issues, 40, 50 years later, has been resolved. Not one of them. And some of those primary issues are no longer even listed in the top 50. Among those that have not been resolved, that remain polarized, again, gun control. And what happens repeatedly, the same, the shooting, the press will build up on it, and then if enough noise is made, the issue is raised again, but it's polarized. And you cannot resolve issues that way. Impossible. It never happens. And we remain caught up in that polarity. And we do the same in our personal lives. We never resolve our own issues. We keep on the fence, one place or the other. We say, good or bad, right, wrong, yes, no, black, white. And the mind cannot really take it any further. What should I do? Well, um, I don't know. I'm confused. Or what are my choices? Well, I can do this or that. <clears throat> but if we ask ourselves, what upholds existence? Then the mind says, hmm, well, that's a different question. Now, I can take that in many different directions. And what happens is the mind begins to 
be used. <coughs> Remember being told in a science class, teacher, Mr. Fine was his name, and he said we use approximately 6% of our brain power. 6%. Think about that for a minute. 6%. If you were auditioning a performer and he gave you his resume and his photograph and he said, you know what, um, I'm going to use 8% of my ability. You say, what? Get out of here. If you were interviewing someone for a job placement and they told you, I'm bringing 15% of my ability, you'd look at them as if they were, you know, pretty dumb. But yet we accept the fact that we only use 6% of this brain power. I got a hunch it's closer to 3%, by the way. But even if it was 5%, 10%, what does that say? means we can expand the rest of it. Yeah, it should mean that we're thinking, or somehow we're not capable. Well, one of the reasons we're not capable is because of language. What we tell ourselves, how we fuel the mind. That determines almost everything. I've mentioned a number of times previously working with people with dementia. Um, by the way, should you become involved with this and family members or anyone, trust me on this, the so-called experts don't know what the hell they're talking about. It's guesswork to them. They have not advanced this as a science at all. Why? Because they have been focused again and again on nothing but medicating, medicating, and medicating. They're medicating millions of people for dementia without knowing anything about it. It's, it's a crapshoot to them. It's purely guesswork. They don't know what they're doing. The only thing that has succeeded with age-related problems such as dementia is, not surprisingly, opening up the mind. Having people do things they never did before. That shows improvement. Not recovery because some, no, it would take a center. You'd need day tops for that particular thing, for opening up the mind. And then we'd see some real recovery and some cure. Because what is dementia? Now they're telling us that all the brain cells are dying and not being replaced, which is not a proven fact either. And what about all the brain cells that are still alive? Why can't they be activated? Why can't they start doing other things? They can. I'm 76. My memory has not lessened. My memory is stronger than ever. My mind is stronger than ever. My abilities as a writer, creatively, are better than ever. Because I look at what upholds my existence and I use my mind and my mind keeps going in many directions, splitting this way, that way, creating new channels, new avenues, new approaches. And nobody is different, everybody's capable of doing that. Especially if we're not using medications. The medications stop us cold. We become addicted, dependent on the medication, which again compromises the immune system, slows us down in so many ways, makes us ill, the side effects, and then as we get older, we attribute the illness, according to the medical profession, as age. And you buy into it. You're not a spring chicken anymore. Of course you're going to be getting sick more often. I'm sorry, it doesn't have to be. I'm tooting my own horn again. 76, I don't get sick. I haven't had a headache in 53 years, stomachache in 35 years, cold in 25 years. I don't get sick. Don't use even aspirin. How come? Am I from Mars? Am I free? No. 
I do two things. I do not use any medications. I use my mind, and then I exercise, I eat well. It works. The mind can just take off an adventure every minute. What upholds existence is the question to ask at every turn, not what should I do. What should I do gets us only to the polarization, this or that, good or bad. Can you explain what that means, uphold your existence? Yes. Uphold, to lift up. Existence, everything. Your whole being, your personality, your character, your beliefs, your values, your so emotions. You sure you mean defend it? Uphold. You see, defend is defend, protect. Mm -hmm. But uphold, the language itself, lift it up. Bring it to another level Can entirely. Can you give us the example that you've given before? Or another one? I had a horrendous problem within my family about seven, eight years ago. And uh, we were all suffering as a result of it. And it came down to legal matters, uh, some moral issues, property rights, things. And uh, we were being torn apart by it uh, on every level. And I was caught up in the games of right or wrong, the polarization again. Should I do this? Should I do that? What the lawyer says here, what the lawyer says there. Who gets this? Who gets that? And it got so bad that my dear friend, Mie, who is my editor, um, noticed one day that my hands were trembling. And I just sat down and I said, what the hell am I doing? I'm not following what I believe here. And I went into hypnosis and focused on what upholds my existence as opposed to the issues related to this property, right, wrong, etc. And within five or six minutes, I came out of it and got on the phone and said, write up the contract exactly what you want. Don't worry about anything. It's OK. It was over. Done. What upholds existence was my love for those people, not the issues. The mere fact that I was asking that question again took me to another place, that place of where I believe what I hold to be true values in life, as opposed to just the details. That's why we cannot resolve any of these problems. That's why we're polarized. We're not actually relating to what upholds existence, whether it be gun control, abortion rights, any of this stuff. We're not dealing with that. We're dealing with the details. And then we get into the legal matters, right or wrong, good or bad, yes or no. It doesn't work. And it doesn't open the mind up. The channels that need to be opened to find answers and resolve problems never get opened. For whatever reason, those words, what upholds my existence, change that. They're miraculous. And they work. Use those words in place of what should I do, where should I go, how should I do it, when should I do it, for a year. And you look back on that year and you'll say, wow, I did things I never thought I could do. It changed my whole life. It literally takes you into a different level of thinking and, it, and everything changes. Language, again, the fuel of the mind, the words are important. The exact words we use. If we use the wrong words, that's what the mind relates to. Does that help explain it? It's a hard one to grasp. <clears throat> Life is for living, loving, and creating, not despair, depression, drugs, and death. Living, loving, and creating. Pretty basic. There's nothing mysterious about that. We should be living, loving, and creating, as opposed to being focused on the despair, depression, drugs, and death. We can't be doing them simultaneously. Does not work. Does not work. We always fail at that level and become not only our worst enemies, but entrenched in being our worst enemies, as opposed to being our best friends. 
Let's open it up just for questions and thoughts. I'd like to hear from everyone just in a general sense about the whole topic of we are our own worst enemy. Anyone, please? Well, um, I've been looking at <coughs> how I, my own worst enemy and becoming noticing and being aware of what I say to myself, like, oh, that doesn't matter, uh, instead of paying attention to something and going, well, yes, it does matter to me, and what do I need to do here, or say here, or um, what are some other things I say? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's one. <laughs> but you know, she, she says, what do I say? Again, language. Always language. That's what goes to the mind first. Language, along with emotions, those two primary things. So yeah, every time you ask yourself that, I, should I be saying, what should I do? Or, huh? I don't know. Then it works, it generates something. Okay. So yeah, uh, along the same lines, is language fuels the mind, you know, what we tell ourselves. And, and that really is uh, very key because we do create with our words. If you say I'm a shy person, then that's how you act and that's how you feel and that's how, what you create. And if you say I'm an outgoing person, then, then you create something totally different and it, it really is language. Yeah. And then if we're wise enough to take that and say I'm going to act as if I am not shy, I'm going to act as if I am confident, I'm going to act as if I'm a responsible person. I'm going to act as if I can be on time. I'm going to then we have the answer, as opposed to it remaining, don't know, here, there, yes, right. The whole idea is to resolve, 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 solve. And language is a major part of it. The two elements that we always have to deal with, again, are emotions and language practical parts, emotions and language. And we don't do that by simply saying yes or no, good or bad or right or wrong. Or again, why is it that not one issue in a country like America in 45 years has been resolved, not one single issue? That kind of thinking is why. If people really the gun issue, you know, what upholds existence if every human being in this country would really just stop and think about what upholds existence, we get somewhere with the gun issue, just as we get somewhere with all of the issues. Because it would change our thinking, change the way in which our minds operate. We go from that three to six percent, maybe to eight, ten, twelve percent. Can you say that in other words? No, what? no. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you. you see, because a lot of people try to change the words, but the words were created by a spiritual man, a master, because he understood language. He understood language perhaps better than anyone in the world. And the words that came out of his mouth were very magical in that way. And over a period of 45 years since I was introduced to those words, and by the way, I was as, as uncomfortable with those words as anyone was. And I don't, what upholds my existence? That doesn't sound right. It's not what I would say, and I could say it this way. And uh, I would try to say it this way, but it didn't work the same way. I just, I don't know. Do you get it? Because well, I'm... You're going, okay. Like, like, what defines me, or where do I... What upholds you? Think of the uphold. What, what upholds people in general? what they feel about themselves, what they believe in themselves, their life values, how they really live and acknowledge life. And, you know. Most of us really feel we know what those things are. Like we go stand on the corner and ask people, do you believe in God? Do you believe in love? Do you believe in kindness? They'll say yes. But do they really live that way? Do they really uphold those things? Most people don't. But if you say, uphold those things, Uphold the ideal of kindness. Same man who said, what upholds your existence says, love before you speak of love. Another very 
Hmm. Language. <clears throat> you can see it. You can hold on to it. What upholds my existence? My existence is everything, not just the issue here, but existence, the being of existence in itself, which is so great. It has to boost the mind. We need a rocket boost. And those words will do it if you apply them, if you just get to the, past the initial difficulty with the language. Barbara, are you going to say something about that? No, I was just <coughs> going to say my feeling about assault rifles is if you need an assault rifle to shoot a deer, you shouldn't be a hunter. <laughs> it doesn't hold existence for anyone on that level, no. What upholds existence if you're going to go hunting is if you need food, you know? Right. That, that, that upholds existence. Right. But if you're doing it for sport, that doesn't uphold existence. And as you said, if you're doing it with an assault rifle, that's that what, you know? I, I pass that channel every time, uh, and I, I, I say, I want to wipe it out. How can they actually be talking that way about, I've got them in my sights, the <coughs> super sight thing, you know? <coughs> Poor animal, he's got, you're using a, this, this. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> Does not uphold existence anyway. Well, I was just, before I came in here, I forgot what the topic was, even though I wanted to hear about it. And recently, and it comes and goes, just, I've been feeling so angry. And it's everything. It's, someone can do a little thing. And I just feel like, how can you be do? you know, like, you honked at me? Is that a kind way to even, like, when are we going to show kindness and all this stuff? But then I'm becoming more and more bitter and less and less willing to show kindness. Yeah. And after this whole thing, um, the shooting that happened, the first thought I had was, we're not going to even do anything about this because we're so polarized in this country. The election showed it. And then I just get so angry with it, and I, and I've shot a gun before. I've gone target shooting. I actually don't think that gun should be illegal, but I think that we need better gun control. Just Extreme gun control. <laughs> um, so, you know, and um, I can go on about that. Australia has great gun control, and they've seen the decline of violence drop like 50 percent I mean it's so anyway I can go on with it okay because I want them to be my target now um but it's not helping me you know and I just feel like all I'm doing is becoming this angry angry person and then it's like you just I, I feel like really are you gonna be the one who says that to me now so wh where is this manifesting from the, the Where? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I mean, from, besides my childhood. <coughs> are you kidding? Yes. Like where are you? A thousand, a, thousand so... a, a million different sources within yourself and both internal and external. Mm -hmm. And it always, always, always goes back to childhood. Always. Um, simple reality is we experience everything, every known emotion by the age of five. We will never experience a new emotion after that. All we'll experience are new details, different manifestations of the same types of problems. But by the time we're five years of age, we've experienced every single emotion. And none of it has been lost. It's all there. The process is so basic if we understand it. We have sense organs. We respond, we're aware through our senses which trigger off emotional, all those emotions from the time we were born, and then the mind perceives accordingly. And you get, why am I feeling all this? Because it's coming out, it's emerging, including the anger, which is a very natural human emotion. So it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but, but, but is it okay? Is anger it, is okay. Not, anger. Is it if you like deal with or if you acknowledge it or understand if you acknowledge if it, you let it go. Let, if you get in touch with it and you understand what it is. If I'm angry, let's say I get angry at Barbara. Do you mind if I get angry at you? Oh, no. <laughs> let's say Barbara does something to me. 
whatever, and I feel anger, whether it's deserve it or not is not the question. It could be right, wrong, or crazy, but I feel anger. And I turn to Barbara and say, I feel angry at you. It's emotion, what I feel. I'm not saying, Barbara, I'm going to kick your teeth in, which is a threat, or Barbara, you're a four-eyed, lousy bitch, which is vile, or which is violence. That's what causes the violence, because we will not express the anger in a normal, healthy way. Anger is a normal, natural emotion. So what you're feeling is natural. It's just you say you're frustrated about what to do because it involves so many different things. Yeah. And many and people are in the same boat. We're angry at a lot of things and we're frustrated because we can't do anything about it. How many of you saw the movie Network? Remember that wonderful scene where where he asks everyone to go to their windows, open the windows, oh, and start shouting, I'm not going to take this anymore. <laughs> I'm, uh, no. The reason that movie, one of the reasons it was so successful, everyone identified with it. We all want to be able to finally express that. And if we did, we'd be a lot healthier. So it's okay to feel it. You just need to know where to direct it now right. and how to finally release it so that's not working against you, not festering anymore. But if every little thing is making her angry, like something right. honking at her, right. it's like something because she needs those to be things, free to let something go. They connect with everything. Let's use the honking thing, and I've told you, the driving is a typical <laughs> thing we all experience. We get in the car, trying to go someplace in a timely <clears throat> way, and what happens? It begins to rain, and suddenly everybody's driving like a, like a fool, you know, and nobody is signaling, no one will let you in. You feel all of that. Is it coming from that moment alone? No, it's coming from millions of experiences like that. That whole emotional memory, and then it hits you like that. And if you recognize that it's coming from that source, then you can stop and say, hey, okay, I'm feeling this, but I can be patient with it. I know where that's coming from. It's not going to let it get to me. No, I'm not going to. And slowly you begin to adjust and work with it. And then the, you have the internal and the externals. Yeah, what do you do about this killing? All people feeling so many different things about tragedies. We're identifying with people. Um, by the way, that shows another value lapse, very strong value lapse in our society. We feel so much about these 28 people Yet there are people, I'm sure, who died right here in Fremont, in Seattle, perhaps from cancer, perhaps from heart attack, from heart, perhaps from shooting dope, from hit by a car, whatever. Do we feel for them equally? No, we don't. Why? Because we don't have the value structure where every life is important. Instead, we get caught up with things that we can all identify with, such as this killing, and we latch on to that. 9-11 is another example. 3,000 people died. So a lot of emotion attached to that. But yet 44,000 people die every year in a car accident. What about them? What about the 105 people who die every year in hospital from infections? What about them? How come we don't identify with all those people? Something wrong with the value structure there. Does it make the news? Right, if it makes the news, then it becomes prominent, and then we look around, oh, are you giving $10 to the Red Cross? I'll do the same thing. Back uh, in Brooklyn, when I was about oh, 12 years old, there was some, something happened. A little girl, I think two and a half year old child, was walking in the backyard somewhere and wandered off into a, uh, an, uh, a lot, a vacant lot, and fell into a pit and someone heard her screaming. To make a very long story short, this became big news because everyone's attention was drawn to it. And within 24 hours, there were TV and news cameras there, police, firemen, hundreds and hundreds of people, and front page news, the whole country was focusing on whether or not they were gonna go because the child had fallen about 30 feet down and was now silent. They didn't know if the child was dead or not. Everyone was focused on this child. Finally, about two days later, they were able to bring her up alive. And everyone felt, you know, it was celebration time. What about all the other people? 
what about all the other children who, you know, were suffering, who were being beaten that day, molested that day, hungry that day? Something wrong with our value structure. I mean, what truly upholds existence? Being kind, being loving to every creature, every person. Not just where it's convenient because everyone is kind of looking at you and it, you know, our image is good now. I don't see that as a good image um, until we really focus on every human being. I, there's a problem. But going back to what you said, no, it, it's what you're feeling is real. And now you've got to learn to get it out and express it and direct it in its various ways and uh, release it and go from there. Well, yeah, I had to do that the other day, driving in that rain. Someone actually put, made a right-hand turn in front of me. Made a right-hand turn. <coughs> and I just missed him by inches. Lay on that horn, you better believe it. And not only did I lay on my horn, I pulled off to the side of the road, waiting for him to come so I could say something, pay attention. And then, after a couple of cups of chamomile tea, <laughs> I was able to calm down. But I almost lost my life that day. I mean, he really could have told is, me. Is that a good reason to be angry? Yes. Yes, absolutely. You're darn right. That's why we have anger as an emotion. If we didn't have it, then what would we do with all that emotion? What, what? Well, I suppose as long as you can let it go, but you exactly. just let that... <coughs> oh, no, no, no. That's so unhealthy. That no, of course. That, that, that keeps festering inside of you again and will ultimately come out as vileness, threat, hostility, and violence. So she's angry about everything. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay because all that's happening is the anger emerges. And for a lot of people, that's a big, big, huge, important step. Um, because we've been trained to not get angry in our society. And I think uh, one thing, <clears throat> you know, this is external and this is all internal, but a good example is, again, going back to the shootings, Facebook, which I'm almost about to get off just because of this, and people going, well, let's talk about something light. Let's talk, you know, here's something, here's a good thing to look at. And to me, I'm thinking, can't we just be uncomfortable right now? Because maybe being angry, being in grief, being will actually get us to do something different. But it's this cover up constantly about in, in the social and that social networking stuff. It, it's a big deal. Yep. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, they've done studies on Facebook that about Facebook that people's self esteem gets lowered once they get on Facebook. I mean, there's tons of studies on, you know, the whole thing. But I'm seeing how it's like, don't be upset for too long about this. Let's look at this. And it's like, what? Well, it's another form of childhood, and that's plugging us into the childhood of shh, don't be afraid, don't be angry, don't cry, all the don'ts. And that's what we do in this, as a society, basically. We don't get angry at anything. We didn't get angry at George Bush. We weren't allowed to. We weren't free enough to be able to tell the truth to George Bush. I mentioned a couple weeks ago when Harry Belafonte, who was a famous star, came out and called Bush a terrorist. He was told by Bush, you can't say that to the president. I've been told repeatedly, don't, 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 don't say things about Obama, don't call him a compulsive liar. Well, he is a compulsive liar, so I say it. Am I the only person who feels that way? No. We're afraid. We're so afraid. I use the national anthem thing again. Go to a baseball game. Before the game, everybody's got to stand. Da, 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 da. Those 40,000 people that game, does every one of those people really believe in that national anthem? Are there maybe 30 people who don't want to sing it, who'd rather sit down and say, no, I don't like the song, I don't like the words, the bombs bursting in air? No. You know what happened? You're going to be arrested. Literally arrested if you sit down and don't sing the national anthem. People jeer at you, they'll throw things at you, and then the police will come along and say, you're causing a disturbance, and they'll take you right off. We can't express anything. And yet again we think we're free. To me that's not freedom. And when we repress those things, 
whether it be the anger, the fear, or the pain, we're in trouble. And that's again why we're so depressed. We are our own worst enemies. Other people have talked on that topic. Uh, I've uh, heard from the, book, the Buddhist philosophy that we attach to outcome too much. You know, that uh, we plan a big meal around the Christmas time, but everything must be right. And, you know, lumpy potatoes and all this stuff. And we're attaching to outcome instead of just enjoying the company of others. Attaching to outcome, but many ways of looking at that, uh, including we expect as a result of doing things. Expectation plays a big part, of course, in outcome. And whenever we expect we are in trouble, um, that leads to a great amount of disappointment. And what we should do, what really upholds existence, is to do what you believe in without expectation, without any. I, I use the old James Cagney thing. Stand on your marks, look the guy in the eye, and tell the truth without expectation. He might spit in your face for telling you the truth. He might say, I'll never talk to you again for the rest of my life. He might call you a lunatic. <clears throat> it's okay. It's like you blow your horn, you waited for that guy. Express what you feel. Unfortunately, he turned at the next street. I didn't get him. <laughs> Unfortunately, he may have had a gun. <laughs> P possibly, yeah. Unfortunately. That's what's scary. Mm. We're all heroes in cars and cowards at the same time. Safest place in the world to act out is behind the wheel of a car. Um, you can make faces, you can do strange things, you can act like you're a tough guy and then drive off. Um, which is another way of, you know, being our own worst enemy. But sort of back to what she said, I'm feeling bad for her because I've, I've had friends who, you know, are just get angry about everything, and it's like, wow, chill out. You're just do they get angry, or do they just express, or do they dump? Well, do they actually just say, "I'm angry. I need you to no, stop they doing don't. that"? No, no, no. Okay. They're just they're just pissed off all the time. Okay, it's right. Like anything anybody does, they have something you know, mean and negative sense. Like, right, they have. Yeah, but that's negative. Right, but that, that's, that's, that's not anger. Yeah. Again, that's not I anger. Know, but that's kind of. Yeah. Where, what, how they're expressing Yes, them, exactly. And they're letting everything make them angry. Right, right, but it's not, but as long as like, you understand it, it's go. not anger. That's not anger. It's vileness, hostility, dumping, all that stuff. But it's not anger. Anger is a pure emotion, just like fear is a pure emotion and pain is a pure emotion. That's how we deal with it. Exactly. And uh, when we turn anger into, you are a dirty, Get you know, which is the way we learn it, you know? You learn to, to do all the dumping on people. Right. And, but when somebody is doing that all the time, constantly being negative, it's usually a defense mechanism. Their, their, their self-esteem is, is not that great, so they tend to rip other people up. Right. And the Can't ego becomes do. involved, and then you have that same thing going on again, as opposed to, I'm angry, mm -hmm. or I feel pain, or I'm hurt or I'm scared, if we relate to the pure emotion, then we can process that, and we can live with it also. But when we turn it into all these other things, then we create resentment, guilt, bitterness, and ego conflict, and it just worsens as we go along. So they need to identify. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and deal with them. Yeah, because yeah, they, really, they, they're trying to suck you in. <laughs> Um, I've learned that uh, most often that when I'm angry, I'm masking the fear. And again, back to the 12-step deal, what am I really afraid of? Which is identifying, as was just said. Uh, but is passive-aggressive behavior to push everyone away from me because I'm frightened? And that's the anger that at one time I lived in, and it was being modeled to me, so I thought it was normal. If it's the only thing I've ever experienced around me, well, I'm going to do what everybody else is doing. Exactly. And that's what we do. And we don't have the models who really understand, especially on an emotional level. But we're so far removed from any of the reality of emotions that, of course, we don't have the language to accompany it. We don't know what, what we've been talking about emotionally. It's like, a, what is it? 
Emotions are totally, totally bastardized in America, each and every one of them. Everything is turned to something else. To go over that again, we've got a few minutes. Anger is the perfect example. We turn it to a dozen other things other than the pure emotion of anger. We turn fear into panic, stress, anxiety, tension, <coughs> reactions, rage. rage, as opposed to, I'm scared. Fear is a pure thing. Again, the Dalai Lama, when asked about it, when he was here in Seattle, said very good emotion, very beneficial, because it forces you to make decisions. Which what is what is fear? Fear. fear. Okay. And it's very, very true. I mean, if we think of fear as an illness, then we're going to fuel the mind with that every time we're frightened. And then again, we're going to go to a doctor and they're going to say, well, you're suffering from panic attacks. What is panic? Panic is heightened fear. Negative anticipation based on old emotions that are triggered by something here. So we get into it. Just talking about fear. And as soon as you tell a person, hey, stop relating to panic attack and relate instead to, at this moment, you're feeling a lot of fear. And it's heightened because it's connected to a lot of old memories, old experiences as well. And then the person can say, oh, okay, I can begin to relate to that and deal with it. Whereas if it's panic, it's out of range now, it needs medication and management. And the minute you go along with that, you're done for. Well, and, and something I think in what you had up there is, is it based in reality? Or? Is, is what your fear, is the fear that you're feeling, is it based in reality or is it based on some, like I said, emotion that's coming up right. that really it's not grounded, it's just... No. Most of it is going to be from childhood again. Mm -hmm. It's just you're not going to interpret it as that. Instead, you're going to focus on the immediacy of what's happening. And then if you panic about that, then you're going to you know, suddenly throw up your arms and give up. Now, a good question for <coughs> that type of a person is, why do you feel that way? What, what well, is causing most of you to think feel can that? figure that out or they don't know? They just are caught well, up in the Well, that's just panic. it. It puts on the brakes. Yeah. And they really usually can't come up with it. The then, well, for one thing, again, we don't have a source of feedback because at Daytop, you were asked constantly, how are you feeling about that? Yeah. And the defensiveness would come up, but, and, and they'd say, well, get to what you're really feeling, for God's sake. Without that kind of place in which you can consistently l relate to what you're feeling, you don't have the training for it. You're not used to doing it. But once you get into it, it's amazing. I begin to get and look at me now, after all these years, I'm still feeling. Yeah, what I teach primarily. The other thing about, we mentioned anger and fear. Pain is, again, an emotion. And it's the most human of all the emotions. And it's absolutely necessary to feel pain. Call it pain, hurt, agony, any description you want. Without it, we will not heal. No healing process without it. The only alternative which we unfortunately go to is the medication to repress the pain mm -hmm. and there's no healing involved in that absolutely none pain remains exactly what it is and then if you get off the medication it returns and you get more frightened and you run to the doctor for more pain relief what's killing people by the tens of thousands in America today pain relief medicine mm -hmm. huge addiction throughout the nation we think we and it's I went for a hernia operation, I think I mentioned about, I guess, 15 years ago. And when I came out of the, uh, and I'm dressing, they came over to me with their prescription. Here, you're going to need this. I said, no, I don't need it. Make a long story short, they had three people there arguing with me. You must take this. They finally told me that uh, it's, uh, their liability insurance is at risk. You've got to take it. I said, I'll take the piece of paper just in order to satisfy your liability thing, I'm gonna tear it up and throw it away because I'm not gonna take your pain relief. And they looked at me as if I was nuts. Anything I had colonoscopy back in March, I told them no anesthetic. 
I said, you can't do that. I said, I certainly can. They said, but you're going to be in pain. You're going to be hurting. I said, no, I won't. I'm a hypnotherapist. I'll be very relaxed. I don't know. They couldn't. They didn't know what to do. Um, they had to go along with it because they actually did not have a law stating that I must have anesthetic. Um, and throughout the whole procedure, they kept, especially just pumping air into me, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. And the nurse, are you really in hypnosis? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I did my heart cap that way. Yeah. yeah. But we're trained to think we need the pain relief, so of course we go for it. And that language, of course, manipulates the mind into believing that you actually need those things when you don't. Anything else? Well, we, well, we, we got another 10 minutes on. We are our own worst enemies. We hear from everyone. Anyway. Um, another one that I've learned that's huge in our society is that an expectation is a resentment in the making, but the resentment is when I drink poison hoping it kills the other guy, like with the driving thing, that I'm going to get him, the other guy doesn't give a damn, he's already off on his own course, and I'm the one who's stewing on it, and I'm hurting myself at that moment, and again, that's back to how the Buddhists say, attaching to outcome. The question to ask yourself when you're into that situation, does it uphold your existence? Yes, you know? very much. And I ask myself frequently, I mean, I use that question at every turn, and I always come up with the proper answer, the answer that really is going to uphold my existence. Um, I, I think because of that four-word statement, my, thing, my life has changed so dramatically, especially in the last 15 years. I look back on it that there's so many things that would not be the same now had not been for those four words. Just redirects everything, including the idea of kindness. Because most of us are not really generating that kindness that we basically believe in. Again, if we were to interview people out in the street, do you believe in kindness? Are you kind? Most people are going to say yes. Very few people are going to say no, I don't want to be kind. But how many are actually kind? How many actually uphold existence by being kind? And, and that's the key to it. Someone, anyone else, please, about the topic of we are our own worst enemies. Anyone? Come on. Just. Well, I'm trying not to keep talking. Yes. <laughs> but I was thinking about when I was going through hypnotherapy and breath work. Um, the breath work was definitely part of the emotional release the course I was taking and um, you know you feel the anger feel the anger and because we were taught to hold the space for feelings without the typical ideas of it we were allowed people to get through what they needed to get through go into you know it might start with anger and then the pain would come and the sadness and then and then finally some relief really through all of it and it just makes me think when you say, oh, I feel so sorry for you, <laughs> that um, for me, I don't, I don't feel sorry for myself for feeling anger, because I know I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. I don't like thinking that I'm becoming this angry person all the time, you know, instead of saying, okay, I get it. I know where this was left off why I'm here I'm talking about the fear and then talking about the pain you know and the levels that it goes down to and it will go down because what happens is because it's been repressed for so long once it starts coming out it's going to come out in bursts mm -hmm. it will explode in your face practically <laughs> and then as you're dealing with life on many levels more obstacles will occur and more Anger will be generating. And that's what it seems yeah, like. It's like yeah, oh my exactly. God, that's really? yeah, that's exactly what happens. Yeah, all that 
right hand turns. It's, all, it's all emerging. That's yeah. all it is. And what happens is once you become accustomed to expressing feelings, including anger, as the feelings emerge and you begin to release them, it begins to balance and adjust. It does balance and adjust. And then it becomes pretty basic. And you know exactly when to express it and when not to. And it becomes the norm. I get angry regularly. I get angry at corporate people. I get angry at thieves. I get angry at you know, all sorts of things. I haven't been arrested in a long, long time. I haven't been violent in a long, long time. And I'm not uncomfortable with anger because it's part of my lifestyle. It's a natural part. If someone deceives me, um, at some clown on uh, the internet selling ink cartridges. So I order the ink cartridges, takes my credit card number, deducts the money, and then they send me an email 10 minutes later saying they don't have those cartridges in stock. I call them up and say, okay, return the money. It's going to take 8 to 12 business days. I get angry. Yeah. And I got angry at them, but I called back and I said, I want to speak to a supervisor. And I said, who's responsible for this? I got angry at him. That person hung up the phone. I called next day back from another phone number because they probably said, don't answer this. And got angry again. Part of my lifestyle. Fine. It's not, I'm not thinking or feeling about that guy anymore. I got it out. But you, so you don't, so here the key is to not be building up that repression again so that you end up with a big storehouse of anger that you're not relating to. Same in a real relationship because man and I express what we feel to one another in a regular way. When it happens, there's no buildup. So there's no hidden resentment and bitterness waiting to come out, which is what the dynamic in most relationships is about. You sit on it, one or two people, then suddenly it begins to leak out, and then suddenly the person reacts, and suddenly you've got a storm. All preventable, as long as you learn to express the feelings in a normal way. The key to not being your own worst enemy Basic key is learn to express feelings. That little voice from being a little girl where I was told that I would never be anything or do anything with my life. I was just a follower. Every so often that little voice tries to announce itself and I have to kind of go, you're full of crap. I am something. I did accomplish a lot. So push that thought out of the way and keep moving on because it wasn't true. <laughs> A couple more minutes. Anyone else who'd like to just relate to this basic topic of we are our own worst enemy on any level? Well, when I came here, there was a bum out there in the park here in your alleyway. And he started, first he was, you know, he had his hand out and I was still in my car and I had my windows rolled up and my immediate reaction was fear. And then um, he just seemed harmless, so I just smiled at him and he started walking on his way. And then something made him angry and he started hitting my car with his cane. And, okay, so then I just parked and he went, and then he just kept going and he was yelling to himself or something. But I don't know if I pushed it away. I was angry, but then my immediate thought was, the guy is just crazy and that's his stuff and he didn't hurt my car, so I let that go. Okay. You used common sense and discernment, which was the proper way to handle it. The whole idea of expressing feelings is not purely to blow away, no. I always tell everyone, with all feelings that you express, side by side with it is common sense and discernment. And you will know when to express and when not to. Safely, 85% of the time, you'll be able to express your feelings. The other 15% of the time, like what you described here, no. Common sense tells you, no. I, I described a, several times during the, the series of classes when I was at Queen Anne, my other location. There's a parking lot right around the corner, and there's a narrow passageway of about 30 feet, a wall here, and so you've got just this much room for 30 feet to walk to the parking lot. So I turn the corner, and I start walking, and I see a car pull up, and a guy gets out, walking toward this 
and I took one look at the person, and all the emotional memories here, the connection again, as soon as I saw him, sight, all those emotional memories from years on the street. I looked one look at him and I knew this guy's dangerous. Just by the way he carries himself, the look on his face, this guy's dangerous. And I had just a split second, because it happens like that, to decide I'm here first. And my ego says I want to keep walking here and I'm going to look at this guy and let him know that I expect him to step aside because I started walking here first. But I look at that guy and I stepped aside. I didn't express anything. Later on I did on that heavy bag and later on I got out some of but common sense and discernment. I don't want them to get a phone call that I'm in Harborview with a stab wound or, you know, because I express my feelings. So yeah, always side by side, common sense and discernment. But nonetheless, 85% of the time, you'll be able to. I was, I was, my point kind of was like, how long do you stay in that anger before you let it go? Did, as long as you need to. Common sense yeah. and discernment too. Yeah. Sometimes it's going to go quickly, you know. Sometimes uh, you need to do two or three things to release it because it's connected to so many other emotional memories. But you'll learn to adjust it as you go along. It, it does reach a point where it happens more naturally. But well, initially, it's again, it's going to... Part gonna... of it, or for me, part of it is, you know, is this important enough to use up that energy? Right. Right. Why waste it? To be... But I've always wondered, is that denial or not? Okay, you know, that's that the like, question. You know... Does it uphold existence? Okay. Does it uphold existence? And when you stop and say then, what is the value? What should I actually do? Is it important enough? Maybe not. It may be it's more important than you realize at that moment. And it depends on your personality and character and your history with expressing feelings. If you have a tendency to not make those things important, then there's a chance you're stuffing a lot of emotions that are still there. If it's more natural for you to express emotions, then it's easier to determine that I don't need to do it here. So it's a matter of really understanding your own personality and the way you express feelings. I also think that there's two different things going on here. One is that someone oversteps a boundary. You get angry. It's authentic anger. It's in that moment. It's there. You're dealing with the situation. And then there's anger that we carry around that it has nothing to do with these little tiny things that are happening. I know. I, I Believe me, I'm aware enough that I'm not going out there and projecting it all over people. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. Um, but there's those two. I mean, there's that leftover anchor, right? That, I mean, come on. Many, many, there are many, I many know different levels. I don't much about a yeah. psychology to know that all of us in this room, if we got down to the nitty gritty, <laughs> we have a lot of stuff to be pissed off about. But, the, but there's that difference, right? I mean, of course, there's that authentic, like, whoa, no, that's not okay to, okay. How much of it is authentic? How much of it is in the here and now is almost impossible to know? unless you really are accustomed to expressing it in a normal way, and then you could get a much better understanding of your own values about anger and where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. But even something that's actually happening to you that's real here and now is still triggering all the old things as right, well. So course. that's coming out as well. And until you get most of that stuff released, it's going to be hard to really determine what's what. Yeah. But the reasons for it are, you know, Myriad, there are so many, and we've got to respect it, that uh, we were born with these emotions for a reason. And without anger, we're basically defenseless. We'd have to just surrender ourselves to everything that people want to do to us, and we would, wouldn't be able to stop it. And what would we do then? Then, of course, we'd have even more violence. Any closing thoughts before we wrap this? My closing thought to everyone is, got a new year coming up, um, make some resolutions, commitments to deal with whatever we're doing that uh, allows us to be our own worst enemy, you know. Just be honest with yourself, write out the things that you know you're doing that create this in you, that allow it to keep going. Um, and. Uh, make some decisions and commitments for the new year. It's a great time. It's a, um, 
to refresh, to uplift, enlighten, and uphold existence. Have a wonderful holiday, everybody. Thank you. From God's own board, each day I die. From the Bering Straits to Palestine, this spring, this brook will ring the bell. No need of wealth, you're in God's hotel. Heaven flow, no pills, no pills.